Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Film Club Podcast, where every month, me and Miss Boo take a deep dive into cinema, a director, actor, genre, or franchise, and we talk about it. This month, we're talking about romantic comedies, and this week, we're talking about... The Apartment. I'm Dean. I'm Boo. And welcome to the Film Club. Welcome, indeed. Uh, this movie isn't new to you. No, The Apartment is a movie I watched in the long, long ago... About two whole podcasts ago on the double feature. Wow, just double cheating on us. Ah, uh, you know, life happens. Um, but yeah, this is a movie that I've seen before. The first time I watched it, I really, really liked it. The second time I watched it, I had kind of like a lukewarm response to it. Mm-hmm. Um, mostly because the person I did it with nitpicked the shit out of it, and I got a little thrown. Wow, I wonder how that feels. I know, right? Uh, but this time around, I think I've finally come around and I've gotten my opinions solidified on the movie. But this is your first time watching it. It is, and are your opinions solidified on the fact whether I like this movie or don't like this movie? I'm of the camp that I did like this movie. I Not only did I like it, I do think it's a great film, but that's my thing. I would hope you liked it. This seems like a movie you would enjoy. Yeah, I, you know, this was my first go of this movie. Didn't know what to expect. Didn't watch the trailer. I ended up really liking the movie. Oh, really? Yeah, I wasn't sure how I was gonna, you know, come out of this because, my God, everyone is banging each other in this movie. And I'm like, this is a movie from when? 1960? And everyone is just, you know, plowing in this office? Like, okay. Yeah, that's one thing that's really wild about the movie because... It, yeah, it is from, like, the year 1960, and it's, like, their production code is kind of laxed up, but, yeah, like, you, I mean, before this, you never saw, like, adultery in movies. No, and, I mean, a lot of the movies that we've talked about in the latter of last year have been lots of conflict with the production code and getting things made. That and was the whole issue with Awful Truth. Psycho, Big Sleep, you know, just all these obstacles that these film companies and movies had to leap to get these movies made. And in this movie, there's adultery, there's, you know, I mean, you see people making out, they're talking about cheating on their wives, and it's just like, my God, you know, this is like night and day compared to the movies that we've been reviewing where it's just a struggle to show flesh. Yeah, and that's the thing about the apartment that I think is so wild is the fact that it feels really ahead of its time yeah. in what it's talking about and also how it's presented. Because I, I've always thought Billy Wilder was one of these directors that was making movies 10 years ahead of himself. Yeah. Like Sunset Boulevard, Double Indemnity, um, The Apartment Here. Um, uh, Some Like It Hot. Yeah, those were all movies that felt like, oh, this guy's working at a pitch that's like way ahead of where his stuff is now. Because he wanted to make this in... 46. This would never have happened in 46. And that was the thing. He came up with a concept for it and everyone shot him down. They're like, this is never going to get made. You'd have to compromise so much of the movie that it wouldn't even be the same thing on the other side. So he had this in his back pocket until he made some like it hot and he had enough sway to get it made. Yeah. And I mean, I think I was kind of surprised because I know the name Billy Wilder and I was just kind of like, I can't really place, you know, your movies But once I saw his filmography, I'm like, my God, he's had some bangers in his career. He is one of those directors that I think does get maybe forgotten in mainstream Hollywood, like, circle Mm -hmm. people, uh, which is weird. But, you know, when people say, oh, who are the greatest directors of all time? It's like Hitchcock, uh, Kubrick, Spielberg, Spielberg, Tarkovsky, you know, -hmm. uh, know, your Coppola's, people Mm -hmm. like that. Billy Wilder is somebody who probably should be in that conversation. Yeah, because, I mean, he's had some amazing films. Well, the other thing is, oh, he can do comedy, like straight comedy, Mm -hmm. something like it hot. He can do, like, straight drama and noir, like Sunset Boulevard, or, like, straight noir, that's Double Indemnity. He can do these romantic comedy drama films, like The Apartment, that's a genre mashup. He's um, also the first person to win Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay. Oh, oh yeah, that's right, because he was, like, I think he was known as a screenwriter before director. Mm -hmm. But before we get any farther on Billy Wilder, I think we should tell people what this movie is about. I think we need to break out the back of the box. I actually have the back of the box. Wow. Yes. Our first back of the box. See, that's the back of the box right there. Mm -mm -mm. C.C. Baxter, 
knows the way to success in business. It's through the door of his apartment. By providing a perfect hideaway for his philandering bosses, the ambitious young employee reaps a series of undeserved promotions. But when his key is passed to the big boss, J.D. Shieldrake, he not only advances his career, but stumbles on the girl of his dreams. Shieldrake's mistress, Fran Kublik. Kubrick? Kublik? Kublik. Kublik. Baxter, convinced that Kublik is the girl of his dreams, must decide? Does he lose his career, or does he lose the girl? And that's dun, dun, the, dun, dun, dun. And that's the gist of the movie. And I think this movie is interesting if you look at it through the lens of Billy Wilder. Mm -hmm. In this movie, um, there's a lot of him kind of bleeding through in mm -hmm. the relationships, because I found this out. So Billy Wilder, when he was a very... A younger lad growing up in Vienna, uh, right after World War II, mm -hmm. the first girl he ever fell madly in love with was a uh, lady of the night. Okay. And in Vienna, it's like, that's like a profession, like it's not illegal there. Yeah. But that relationship, like, really messed him up. And then you see in his movies where the women are um, a lot looser in this movie than, they pro than women probably are in real life, even yeah. of the 1960s. Because in this movie... Every girl these guys interact with is DTF. Oh, yeah. And, like, even with uh, Fran Kublik, played by Shirley MacLaine here, it, like, she, like, Shirley MacLaine is the most sympathetic character in the movie. Yeah, because it's not like the other girls that we see that are DTF and, you know, oh, he, he picked me up and he's going to take me here and we're going to go there. With Shirley MacLaine, you know, it's, I knew he was married. We fell in love and, you know, he was telling me he was going to leave, you know, her for me. So it's like, you don't see, like, it was just this thing of, ooh, this is the big boss, you know, let me sleep with him and, you know, get what I could get out of him. It's like, no, I actually have feelings for him, and I'm conflicted with, he's got a family, what should I do? Should I pursue love, or should I let him go? And I think that's an interesting thing, looking at it through the lens of Billy Wilder and his complex relationship with women, mm -hmm. is he sees all, all all women as this, you know, very odd paradigm of, like, the virgin whore complex. Mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting to see it in this movie because all these women are, for the most, like, you know, we'll, we'll say easier types of yeah. gals. But all the women in this are very sympathetic. Yeah. At least, at least to me, because all the men are the scummy dudes. All the women seem to be, no, we're not doing anything wrong. We're just, you know, being implicated in these guys' bad actions. Yeah. And I mean, you also have the woman that, um, Jack Lemon's character meets at the bar later on in the movie where it's, you know, yeah, my husband, you know, he's so cute. And yeah, he's locked up in a Cuban prison, but I could come home with you, right? And it's just like, lady, you're just as scummy as the guys. I mean, yeah, but she was funny. <laughs> oh, no, she was funny. But it's like, you know, you kind of ride that line of, you know, judging these characters for their actions and, you know, sympathizing with the characters that are kind of just going along with these actions instead of kind of, you know, putting their foot down and be like, no, this is wrong. And I think that's an interesting thing about the movie because I feel that's a big theme of the movie is complacency. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, that's the whole thing with Baxter, played by Jack Lemon, our, our lead. Yeah. He is very complacent in all the wrongdoings around him and he's pretty, in not, not encouraging, but he's pretty much selling his integrity for... For, he, you know, personal gain. He's basically sold his soul for this job. Yeah, and it's interesting because um, Baxter's arc in the movie, mm -hmm. his arc isn't beating up Fred McMurray and taking Fran off to the Bahamas and living a life of luxury for the rest of his days or whatever. It's him growing a backbone. Yeah. Like, the ending of the movie is him realizing, like, you know what? No, I... Because I don't want to be the guy that got ahead for selling his apartment, for selling my soul, mm -hmm. to you. Yeah. Mr. Shieldrake. Mr. Um, Fred McMurray, you bastard. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you I... tall, good-looking bastard. Okay, I'm, I'm stopping right there. Fred McMurray is a horse-faced gentleman. He's good-looking. He is a... He's a... He's a long, uh, long-faced kind of kind of fellow. All right. Yeah, but I mean, some guys could pull off, you know, the long face features. Fred, do you really think Fred McMurray is attractive? Or are you just joking with me? No, 
know. I mean, he's attractive, but I mean, he's no Cary Grant. <laughs> Cary Grant is still your standard of male excellence. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but it's like, you know, you could see the differences, you know, from these scummy guys that are borrowing Baxter's apartment, mm-hmm. who are these older men who should know better, have been married for a hundred years, and then you have him, you know, the head honcho, where it's like, yeah, you know, you're attractive, you have, you know, basically the perfect family, where you have the wife, you have the two sons. Big house, upstate. You, you're rich, because you're running this business. You're good. And then, no, he's equally as scummy as these guys on the lower levels of this, you know, establishment. Is that commentating on, like, the corruption of power? Yeah, because, I mean, he he builds this up where, you know, he brings Baxter in and he goes, I know what you're doing. We've had this issue before with gambling, and I had, you know, the building raided, and, you know, just showing how powerful that he can be. And then it's like, yo, if you're willing to step over all these guys and give me your key, I could really help you out, friend. And it's just like, we see this two-faced guy where it's just, I thought you were good. I thought you were going to be one of the good guys, and you turned out to be just as scummy as the other guys. And it's interesting, because Fred Murray, he wasn't even supposed to be in this movie. Really? Yeah, so the um, original actor that they cast and that Billy Wilder wanted for the role uh, died suddenly two weeks before shooting. Wow. But he had worked with Fred McMurray on Double Indemnity, mm-hmm. I think a couple years before that. Yeah. And basically called him called him in as a favor. Mm-hmm. And Fred McMurray filled in on like two weeks notice to do the movie. <sighs> Not bad. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Fred McMurray really does nail the part mm-hmm. of this kind of aloof distant guy that can make this snappy dialogue work and also you can i can buy him being a scumbag yeah you know because I, there's something about him where i look at him and i'm like yeah you're the kind of guy that has probably like cheated on your wife every summer for the last like five years and then you see how progressively it gets worse the more that the truth is revealed in the story and it's like my god you are worse than these guys yeah because again uh the production code isn't completely gone with this movie we're what was the implication that you got from the apartment being used are they actually like like banging because it seems like they're just partying you know they're always like oh there's a lot of music people are like dancing and stomping around i mean in the beginning you know it's being used right away. Yeah. So it's like, okay. And I was just kind of, you know, sitting there and thinking of the production code. I'm like, all right, this can't be the whole story. Mm. I'm like, let's see how it progresses. But when he gets the phone call after he finally gets to go back into his apartment and he's doing the whole spiel of, I just took a sleeping pill. I need to sleep. And the guy's, I got, I've got this girl, you know, she looks like Marilyn Monroe. She sounds like her. I need 45 minutes. And then she starts talking to him. He goes, scratch that. I just need 30 minutes. And I'm like, yep, yeah, they're just banging all over his apartment. Doesn't care. And this is so gross. <laughs> that That's the that's the thing I kind of wanted to talk about. Because what what is his, like, what is he actually getting out of this relationship with these guys? Because obviously it's like promotions, but... He's cleaning up after them. What exactly is he cleaning up? Yeah, quote that, unquote. that was like, that is so disgusting. But I was trying to figure that out too. I'm like, is this only for promotional gain? But, or is he also getting paid? Because we, we hear, I think what the first, the first boss where he's like, yeah, you know, you're out of those cheese crackers and oh, can you order more wine for next time? We really like this. And he's like, well, you haven't paid me back for, you know, the last two times. He's like, well, I'll pay you this Friday. So is it a thing where they just pay for food and drinks? Or, you know, are you not charging a flat fee where it's like, yo, if you stain this over here, that's additional. I mean, well, I think that's going in with the Baxter character because Baxter from the get is pretty spineless. Yeah. Like, uh, he it was is... driving me crazy. It was just driving me crazy how he's letting these guys walk all over him i mean your home is where you could be your truest your, self your, your home is your castle exactly and just to let people traipse in destroy it leave whatever they leave in there and I, you're just gonna... i was very confused i'm like are they using his bed because they find stuff in the couches i wonder if that's like one of the 
no-go areas. Like, you can't use my bedroom. But you've seen people head in that direction. So I have a feeling that people are using the entirety of this apartment. I'd be so, I'd be so mad about this. I'm like, bro, can you not bang on my coffee table? Like, my grandmother's coffee table. Can you not? Yeah, I was just sitting there, just, you know, pit in my stomach. Like, my God, why are you doing this? I mean, I get it. You're trying to work your way up in the company and then you have these guys in your pocket where it's like, hey, I do this for you. But you you scratch I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Exactly, but it's like you've sold your soul so far at this point where, you know, you're getting kicked out of your apartment basically whenever. Mm. Doesn't matter that this person made you sick because you had to go sleep on a, a park bench and you can't go back because this guy's, you know, has an appointment for four o'clock at your place. It's like, bro, or that is so... Or one of those guys doesn't return your one apartment key and then you're <laughs> stuck outside all night. Yeah, I'm like, this is just all types of messed up. And I, and I do think that works in the movie's favor because it is showing that this Baxter character on the surface is almost pitiable with how spineless and how, like, sad his life really is. Like... Does he just crawl into bed after they're done just because he's so lonely? He's like, at least I'm crawling into a warm bed. Like, granted, that's a really, like, gross thing, but it's also, like, so incredibly sad. Well, I I don't think he reaches that level of sadness because he does have to spend time cleaning up the apartment. Mm -hmm. So it's a thing where it's like, even if he wanted to, you know, reach to that level of sad and shame where I'm crawling into a warm bed, I think it's just... Okay, I've worked all day. I've had to wait around for this person to do what they need to do. Now I've got to clean up the apartment so it's ready for the next client the next day. And meanwhile, I got to, you know, eat dinner and go to sleep so I can do it all over again the next morning. Yeah, it it's it's the thing cuz the Baxter character is like starts off so low and so sad. Yeah. That it becomes more and more difficult as the movie kind of progresses and he starts to kind of grow a little bit of a backbone. He starts to push back a little bit because you're like, it, it's so soft. Like, it, I granted, but putting I mean, myself in this situation, I mean, I might have gotten fooled once or twice of doing that. But as soon as I find out you're banging in my apartment, I would have probably put the kibosh on that. Well, I mean, considering that, you know, it's affecting your neighbors and at this point you're gonna get your ass kicked out of there then what i wonder i wonder about that because i'm wondering if he's kind of liking his neighbors being like oi you're uh cha cha over there all night and i'm like i wonder if he gets kind of a kick out of being known as like the casanova lothario we see that where it's kind of like the conflict of him wanting to be the nice straight-laced neighbor Versus being the playboy neighbor where they're constantly seeing women coming and going and these loud noises and this ruckus that's coming out of the apartment and him being like, yeah, that's right. That's me. You know, I've got a new girl on my arm every night. So what? I don't care. But, you know, like you were saying with him being spineless and getting, you know, some power and some swagger, Mm -hmm. we see that when he talks to um, Sheldrake for the first time and he goes to Fran and tells her, yeah, you know, soon I'm going to be getting that promotion. Um, let me take you out and, um, oh yeah, I'll pick you up on this avenue. And she's kind of like, well, how do you know my address? And he's like, oh, I know everything about you. I know you had the measles, you had the mumps. I know you have a brother, you have a, a brother, a sister. <laughs> and it was just like, that is so creepy. It, so, so creepy. It is a thing because that's something that in a movie is a very cutesy play. In a movie, that is a very like, Oh, especially of this era. That's like such a cutesy little moment. It's like, oh, he loves her. Oh, he knows these things. You know, oh, he's like, whatever. But it does not play the same in the year of our Lord 2023. Uh, I am sure it's that women stalkery. of... I'm sure women of that time felt the same way where... Oh, well, wow, he, he read... I'm about real women. I'm talking about movie women of 1960. I guess, but I mean, it's just like, you know... Because Fran laughs it off. It's like, yeah, you know, you're not allowed to read other people's files, and this is kind of the reason why, you know, it's like, yeah, that should not be your uh, your pickup line on me, that you knew that in 1950 I had the mumps, and the next year I had the measles, and, you know, this is my family tree, and this is everywhere I've worked. I'm like, bro, that here's, is so Here's the cringe. thing, and I think this works in with the, the tightness of the screenplay, because in that little, um, like, diatribe his little pickup line there right well not even like a pickup line just kind of his um 
ramblings, yeah. nervous ramblings. We find out that she has a brother or a brother-in-law who drives a taxi, mm-hmm. who's kind of a tough guy. We find out that, oh, she has a, a scar from her appendicitis mm-hmm. and she makes the joke of, don't tell nobody I got a scar. I don't want them getting the wrong idea. Yeah. And that's the whole play of those two mm-hmm. later on is they're constantly tricking other people to think they <laughs> they don't have a relationship when in reality they don't have a relationship they don't. and when he says oh i got this scar on my knee she's like well i don't she's used to the same line yeah i don't want anybody to get the wrong idea how i know you got that scar mm-hmm. and in that little diatribe yeah it's so weird that he would think that was an okay thing to do to a woman mm-hmm. but it works in the screenplay because it's a very economical way to set up a lot about fran and her personality in that one moment Yeah, because, I mean, you know, starting this movie, getting through that point, I didn't like any of the men in this movie. I was just like, you have no, you know, redeeming qualities for me. You know, like, you guys are all scum. You with, you know, letting these guys walk all over you. You knowing all her back history. I'm like, this is just creep fest What's but that, as um, but as it builds up school thing uh the he-man woman's hater club are you are you a he woman man hater uh, member in this movie i mean do we really need to go there when you have your own he-man woman haters club not uh, that are coming in a little while uh uh-uh. we're just playing cards <laughs> sure sure yeah, yeah but yeah you know it's not till later you know once fran has her uh hiccup later in the movie that I start to really like Baxter. And I'm like, okay, this is the guy that he really is. He isn't this guy that's trying to climb the the work ladder and doing basically the grossest of tasks to get there. He's a guy that kind of got wrapped up because of his own ineptitude, his own social like inadequacies, because th- this whole thing starts, and we get it um, explained in the movie in some exposition, that, oh, well, Mr. What's-His-Name wanted a place to change into a tuxedo mm-hmm. after a banquet and i said oh you know you can use my apartment he didn't get the in the um conversational dialogue that changing into tuxedo meant hey mm-hmm. i want to go and uh, meet a girl you know after the banquet yeah and he thought oh he's got to change out of a tuxedo that's fine and then suddenly everybody in the office is going to these banquets and he was mm-hmm. like oh, okay i guess you can change a tuxedo at my place and everyone else i assume thought baxter knew what they were talking about but, but he is so oblivious that he's like, yeah, you know, I'll do you a solid. Sure, I'll get out of here for, you know, 30 minutes to an hour. That's kind of weird that it takes you that long to change your in from your work close to a tuxedo. But, you know, it'd be like that. And I think that's what the um, the gist of his his kind of thing going on is he seems so, like, innocent mm-hmm. in his intention. Because he really, he's he's completely complicit in this. He's the reason why all these guys are having all these extramarital affairs. Mm-hmm. But it's one of these things where you feel sorry for him after a yeah. while once you start to realize that, okay, he's he's not a scumbag. He's just kind of an idiot. Yeah, I, I think it's when he's talking to Fran and he's kind of explaining, you know, what's going on. And he's like, yeah, you know, um, well, one Christmas, this person came over. So that meant that, you know, I, I went and had an early dinner. I went to the zoo. You know, I walked around and... You know, eventually when I came back, they were gone and it was kind of a nice Christmas. And it's just like, that's so sad. It's like, that's so sad that you're being pushed out of your home. You're forced to go do things that you wouldn't normally do, but you've conditioned your brain that this is okay. When it's not okay, because this is your home, your private property, you shouldn't have to leave so that people could, you know, I I can't think of a a polite word to (laughs) to phrase it. Bang, 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 Mm -hmm. bang, 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 I should have just said fornicate. You could have also said that, but I had a whole song and dance number. You did, and you did dance, so I appreciate that. Just a little. But, and I think that's the thing, but I, when Fran has her, um, little accident, basically when this movie turns into a straight drama... When she tries to kill herself. Yeah, I was just kind of like, are they sure this is a romantic comedy? We've just been getting a lot of drama. But I mean, it does have its comedic moments in it. it it's really... The, that's something we really should talk about. Because that switch when Fran takes the sleeping pills mm-hmm. after uh, Shield Drake does the whole hundred dollar oh bill. And you God. get that, that like, the look on um, Shirley MacLaine's face. And you're like, oh, God. That's it. You believe you are a prostitute, and that ties back into 
Billy Wilder's kind of, like, complicated relationship with, like, women in this situation. But Shirley MacLaine takes that as, like, I am not your whore. Mm-hmm. I, I thought mean, you loved me. It's like, I wanted one of those movie moments, one of those great knockout moments. I wanted to step into the screen and just knock him on the jaw, knock his ass out. Because I was like, how dare you treat a woman that you've, you know, you've been so sweet to her to get her to fall in love with you. So basically, she'll, you know, bend at your any whim of, I've got free time, meet up with me. And then, oh yeah, you know, sorry baby, it's gonna look weird if I buy you a Christmas gift. So here, hundred dollars, you buy whatever you want. I'm like, how fucking dare you? It's, and I think that's the thing, because Shield Drake, it seems like he has no idea he's doing anything wrong. No. And I think that makes him a much worse villain, mm -hmm. is because he seems so assured that what he's doing is the right thing he's doing, mm -hmm. even though it's all scummy. Yeah. He's just covering his own ass, but we we should talk about um, the other thing in the room. This movie is billed as a romantic comedy drama. Mm -hmm. It is it is definitely dramatic. There's a there's a suicide attempt in the movie. Yeah. There's a very complicated love triangle going on. There's this a uh, will they won't they going on, and it's a very dramatic movie. But the comedy of it, because I think this movie's fucking hilarious. I mean, I thought it was funny. I don't, I don't think it's hilarious. I think it leans a lot on the drama. Mm. It, it's a lot of heavy tones to this movie, but Shir Shirley MacLaine is just so great. She's always on the ball with her one-liners, and she delivers them in such a way where it's like you have to kind of sit back and be like, whoa, she kind of caught me off guard there. I'm like, that was a good one. Shirley MacLaine is quite literally like the best part of this movie. Jack Lemmon is not far behind. Jack yeah. Lemmon is a fantastic actor. But, he kills it as bad. But I'm biased because I love Shirley MacLaine. Oh, yeah. So, you know, this was kind of really my first Jack Lemmon movie. This was also my first Jack Lemmon. So I wasn't really sure what to expect of his comedy styles because I'm so used to her. Well, um... Sorry, I keep. I sorry, I keep interrupting you. Go but ahead. Jack Lemmon, he's also in Some Like It Hot. He's yeah. uh, opposite Tony Curtis. Oh, so then it's not. Yeah, right. of course. Yeah. yeah, but um, like I'm, I really like Jack Lemmon in this, and Shirley MacLaine kills it. I love their dialogue though, mm -hmm. because there's so much comedy kind of wound up in their little back and forth. Yeah, like especially the stuff on the elevator mm -hmm. uh, when you know, or when. Um, one Mr. What's his face walks out and gives uh Fran a little little pat on the tush, like, and she's like, "One of these God. days, you're gonna get your hand a little too close to the elevator doors, and whoop, and and to close the doors, mm -hmm. and it's a whole." And whole, then she, you know, you know she thing. pops her hand into her sleeve, and she just kind of you know waves at him with the no hand. It was just like nice little bit of gag. Yeah, it's hilarious, but it was just or, um, like, this movie had me wanting to throw hands since the beginning. I was just like, "What is happening?" What, what about the phone? The phone conversation when Jack Lemmon is going through, and he's like. Look, I'm really thick. I need to take uh, uh tonight off. And it's like, ah, I can't do that. You know, it's his birthday. It's like, what if I can pencil on this day? Uh, yeah, I can do that. All right, give me a minute. And he goes and he has to call like six different people yeah. to move one day in his date book for his apartment. And it's uh, that that is fucking hilarious. I love that little phone combo. That's a funny back and forth yeah. with everybody. Like the gag there is is great, but but really, you didn't have any um laugh out loud moments in the movie. I'm any good chuckles? Did you get a good chuckle out of any part of the movie? I mean, I'm sure I did. I mean, uh, let's see. It's really hard to laugh at a movie where uh, Shirley MacLaine's getting slapped to consciousness by a doctor. Yeah, that was <laughs> rough to watch. Because, I mean, it's just, he's, you know, going heavy-handed smacking her. But, you know, I get it. She's overdosed on pills. You've got to do what you got to do because you're not in a hospital setting. So he's doing everything manually, you know, pumping her stomach pouring hot coffee down her throat. So, I mean, I think that is such a strong scene to show that he is doing what he can to revive her. But it's just like, bro, this is romantic comedy month. We took a hard left into drama. It's like, what is happening? But then Mrs. Dreyfus shows up, the doctor's wife. Oh, I and, loved her. And she then takes, it's like, oh, we were so serious. And she's like, let's bring back some comedy, some levity to this. Where yeah. she's like, you don't need a man like that. You see that man over there? That's a bad man. You don't need a man like That's that. That's why I, I love now, that. Now take some soup. You, you look so thin. Yeah, I love that, you know, she's comedic relief, but she's also a mother in a sense where we don't get too much backstory on... Shirley. On Fran's parents. We know that she lives with her sister and her brother-in-law. So we're not sure if something happened to their parents or they live somewhere else, but you have this mother coming in and, you know, saying... You know, this guy isn't good for you, but because she doesn't know 
who Baxter really is. She she thinks Shield Drake and Baxter are one and the same. Yeah, so you know she's there in her corner. You know this guy doesn't even have um, paper napkins here. He's got paper towels. You know, look at this slob. But look, let me help you. Let me feed you soup because I need to get you better through food. You know, my husband already did the heavy lifting of getting the drugs out of you. Now let me cure you with food because. That's what moms do. They they feed you. Yeah, and and the other thing is, af- right after that scene, we have another bit of uh, levity from Shirley MacLaine's yeah, friend. I, I, I love the their their dynamic where they're kind of getting to know each other versus just you know the high and buys of the elevator. Yeah, and I love when uh, Fran is going through her her love life and how mm-hmm. she's like, I'm unlucky in love. First boy I ever kissed was in a graveyard. <laughs> I, I knew it was bad from the start. And see, there's a little chuckle yeah, there. Yeah, because I was like, like the like, last I, man I fell in love with, he was the head of a hedge fund. Mm. You know, after they found some things in his bank, he said, you know, for me to wait for him, he'll be out in three to five. Mm-hmm. And I, I was like, okay, that's a good game. Yeah. That's a good little bit. But it's also kind of revealing of um, Kublik's relationships where she's a, a woman that's kind of addicted to relationships. She's addicted to these not great relationships. Yeah, this kind she, of love life. She falls for these men that aren't, you know, very much available for her or won't do anything for her. It's or all for good them. good guys at Yeah, all. so it's like you could see why this, you know, being thrown the $100 bill and, you know, shut up, you know, I'll see you after the holidays, how that would push her over the edge because, you know what, I'm going to be the one to, you know, leave you ultimately. And you're going to have to sit there and think about, you know, I died because of what you did. And that, this, okay. The thing about her um, suicide moment there, yeah, which uh, uh, I guess trigger warning, you know, we are talking about a movie suicide, but whatever. Um, or I think there's even a thing where you can't really say that word. They don't want that word being said. So a lot of people are saying they're unaliving themselves. I will not degrade. It is a serious enough topic that I feel like <laughs> I'm okay being demonetized talking about it. Okay. But I'm just letting you know. I understand. But her moment in the movie where she decides to... Um, it's gut-wrenching. Oh, it is incredibly sad. It is heartbreaking. And then when they open up the her quote unquote suicide note, it's just the hundred dollar bills mm-hmm. in there. You feel so bad. You feel so bad, but that's also also the ultimate fuck you to him. Where it's just like you are the reason. And if people are curious what this means, he'll know. But the other thing is when Jack Lemon comes in and finds her, right? Because he doesn't. He just thinks she's passed out in his bed, drunk, and he's like, "Oh, oh, really?" That th- mm-hmm. he's looking at it as like this is the l- biggest insult you could have given. He's like, you know, I I like you, and yeah. you and I come home after you have had a tryst with my boss, and you are lying in my bed asleep. This is the biggest insult I can ever have, and he's just going on and on to her unconscious oh, yeah. body, and then he it- finds out what's wrong, and then you're like, oh my god, what's he gonna do? And then immediately he's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta kick this girl out. I gotta get the doctor and I gotta try and save her. I gotta try and do everything I can to make her better. It's such a smart scene because it's funny that he's, you know, going off on her, not knowing that she's half dead Mm -hmm. and smart in the sense that, you know, he's dead drunk, but this, you know, sobers him up very quick and he's able to think on his feet. And you know what? Uh, ambulance isn't going to get here in enough time. I've got a doctor right next door. I need to save her before I lose her. And I think that part of the movie is when the movie kind of flips for both of their characters. Because mm-hmm. before that, we have, um, you know, uh, uh, Baxter as this spineless, um, what, what does Dr. Dreyfus call him? A, uh, oh God, it, it's, he, he's like, you're not even a mensch. You're yeah, a, he, you're, you're a something. Yeah, um, you're not a mensch. You're a something else. And. I don't I, know I, a schmuck, but it, it, it probably is a schmuck. But in and we're like, oh, he's a spineless whatever. And then after this, when you start to like know him and he starts to develop more with that relationship, you're like, no, he's he's like a good guy. And before that, Fran's like, oh, she's the other woman who's kind of like a sad sack, but she's not saying no to anything. And then after that, you're like, oh, oh no, oh honey. No, no, well, you're that, just in love with the wrong man. Yeah, and you see, she even says it herself and kind of puts him in the friend zone where she's like, why can't I fall in love with a guy like you? Which is always, you know, the... Uh, you know, the stab in the soul. Yeah, you know, dagger to the heart of, you know, I am good for you, I could be good for you, but these characters have to go on their path to realize this isn't cutting it. And this is, and that's why I love the ending of this movie. Yeah. Like, 
do we want to talk about the ending yet? Uh, I mean, we, we did talk about like that the the midpoint, but the, the ending of the movie is is beautiful, right? I it is. I mean, we could talk about how their relationship progresses in this quote unquote forty eight hours that she's staying there to kind of you know come back from this suicide attempt. You you mean the the great pasta dinner he makes with the tennis racket? The pasta dinner and him being afraid that she's gonna off herself. Anytime, you know, he's not looking. He starts hiding razor blades. He, I think he hit a bottle of aspirin. Yeah, he um, he comes, you know, barreling into the apartment because they smell gas in the hallway. And he's like, oh my god, she's gonna stick her head in the oven. Or, you know, and she's just, no, I was drying my, my stockings and I, you know, decided to wash your socks for you. And he's just like, oh, well, why'd you do this? Oh, did you have to light the stove? And it's she's like, like I, I live in a bad neighborhood. Yes, you have to light the stove. You have she's to like, physically light the oh. stove. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I love those little moments where he's teaching her how to play gin rummy, mm-hmm. which, you know, I still don't understand how that game is played, but. Oh, not even a little bit. I was like, after watching this, I'm like, I should learn how to play this game. It looks interesting. And, but I love, I love that because they're, de- re- their relationship develops in a very, I don't know if it's an organic way, but it develops in a very, very nice way. Yeah, like because... you start to realize they really are so compatible. They're both kind of these misfits who have been like walked on their whole lives. But we already see that there's a foundation there. When she's working in the elevator, uh, they know each other from seeing each other every day. Small talk. She she comments on, you know, I ride with a ton of people in this elevator you're always the, the only guy that takes off his hat in the elevator. And it, it's these little things that she notices that, you know, he's not like the rest of these schmucks at the office that, you know, are tapping her on the ass and, you know, making rude comments. It's like, no, he's actually going out and talking to her like a human. Yeah. And I think that's like the, the nice thing is like they develop that, they have that mutual respect for each other. And then it kind of develops along those lines. And then once we get to like that, like once, um, Fran gets taken out and Baxter takes the the one-two punch from her brother-in-law, mm-hmm. which is one of those moments where I'm like, ah, oh, that, that kind of like tears him back down because it's like, bro, you took a punch you didn't need to. But then also it's like, that's kind of like a, if he was doing it for anyone other than Shield Drake, that's a backbone move Yeah, of being like, I know my buddy messed up, but I'm going to take the punch for him. Mm-hmm. But it's like, why did it have to be for Shield Drake? Shield Drake is such a scumbag. Yeah, and he's also doing it for her. Because to save her honor. To save her honor so that his, her brother-in-law and her sister don't find out that she tried to kill herself. And she's, you know, kind of involved in this triangle with the boss and his wife. Yeah, and that's a whole mm-hmm. other can of worms. Because we get, like, right after that... It's, you know, New Year's, all that stuff, and Baxter gets his promotion, and... He's an executive, and his office is right next to Shieldrake's, they share a door. And Shieldrake's like, well, my wife is divorcing me. And he's like, oh, you're leaving your wife? No, my secretary spilled the beans, so I gotta leave her, so she has to leave me now, but... I eh, whatever. I love that scene, where it, you could just see everything unraveling for Shieldrake when he fires Miss Olsen. Miss Olsen, who is the one that tells um Fran, you know, you know, you're not the only one. This happens every year with somebody else. She's like, I <laughs> was uh the what is it? I was the executive from Cincinnati. You're the mm. executive from Kansas City. Yeah. And it's like that's the excuse he uses every time to go out with these girls. But I think that was my favorite scene of the movie because this is where shit is really starting to hit the fan. You know, everyone's kind of starting to find out the truth. And then we have that scene where she pulls out her compact mirror to to check herself. And Baxter sees the broken mirror after he had given uh, Shieldrake the mirror like a week or two before. And he was like, oh, it's got a a break. And she's like, oh, yeah, you know, this girl, she she threw it at me and it broke. And then you see that that reveal and just he is torn apart. Do you... I love you so much because that is one of the best scenes in the movie. And also the line she gives, the line she gives when Baxter's like, oh, sorry, the the mirror's broken. She's like, yeah, it makes me look the way I feel. And yeah. I'm like, oh, so good. I love that sequence because it has the setup. It has, you know, the follow through. It has the payoff. She's a broken person and she has just broken him at the same time. And, exactly. And it's done visually. They never, like, he never says it's like, 
Oh, oh man. I, I, I feel broken as well, Miss uh, Kublik, as I look at your mirror. It's like, no, like, because I love you. It's like, no, no, no. Like, that, it's a, such a subtle moment, and I really love how Billy Wilder directs it, and he wrote it. Well, I mean, Baxter's... And he, also, he's wearing that dumb hat. Yeah, the dumb hat. But Baxter's also a good guy where, you know, he's not going to, you know... Be like, he's why not gonna, are you doing this? Yeah, he's not going to tear her down even more than she's already feeling, because... She just broke his heart. He's just kind of, you know, silently drowning in this new sorrow that she's given him. But she is so stuck in, you know, where she's at that she doesn't even notice that he's breaking. And it's it's such a beautiful movie. And 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 then we get to the ending, right? Yeah. Baxter, he's gotten his executive position. Shield Drake's like, yeah, my wife's leaving me. So that means I'm going to need to borrow your apartment a lot more. And he's like, oh, did you find a, a new girl? He's like, nah, me and Fran, we're going to go steady for a while. But that's after I get back from Cancun. You know, man's got to sow his wild oats while he can. Mm-hmm. And then Baxter's like, all right, Mr. Shield Trake. Um, I don't think I'm going to need this key anymore. And he throws a key on the desk, goes back to his office and starts grabbing his stuff. And Shield Drake's like, you gave me the wrong key. And he's like, no, that's the key to the executive washroom. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'll need it. Uh, this is my two weeks notice. And he walks out. And... Then, at New Year's dinner, where they're at the nice tiki bar, which is... Man, I really wish that place was real, because it looks fire. Well, I mean, in all these old movies, whenever it's New Year's, these parties look awesome. Everyone's wearing hats, there's streamers everywhere. It's like, this is a party. Exactly. And they're there, and Fran's like, yeah, same old night, same old soy, same old sweet and sour. And Shield Drake's like, yeah, well, at least I don't have to worry about Baxter. And she's like, why? Well, he quit today. And then you see her face kind of kind of light up because she starts, she realizes she's like, the shrimp grew a backbone. He grew because of me. Because of me, he grew some integrity. I love the scene before this Mm -hmm. where they finally see each other at the office. Oh. And, you know, she's, you know, she comes out and she says hi to him. They're having small talk. And she goes, oh, yeah, you know, um, I got to get going. My date over there is waiting for me. And she kind of looks and it's this, you know, well-to-do woman. Waiting over by the magazine racks. And she's just kind of like, okay. And then you see the two of them split and he walks past the girl. The girl walks away with the guy she was waiting for. And it's just, you know, yeah, you know, he's like, I've got a little bit of swag now. So I'm going to put it in there and make you kind of wonder, huh, we kind of did have a moment, but he's moved on. So, ouch. Yeah, it's that moment is is so interesting to me because if if Baxter said to Kublik in that moment, I love you, let's run away together, that's not deserved. No. Him being like Fran, I uh I know you love Shield Drake and I I love you so much I don't want to get in the way of it. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to lie to you and say I've moved on so you don't have to worry about me so you mm-hmm. can live on your own life. And he walks over and then you see he just buys a magazine and goes off by himself and is in a sad little world. And then that reveal at the restaurant and she's like, wow, that that uh, that schmuck really does like me. And then she leaves Shield Drake and I'm like, fuck yeah. Fuck Shield Drake. I hate I, his haircut. That's what I was waiting for. I was waiting for that moment of, you know what? I don't need this. I don't need you. Um, also, that moment kind of reminded me of La La Land. When Emma Stone kind of decides, or um, I can't think of her name in the movie, uh, Mia. Mm-hmm. When, when Mia decides that this guy isn't the right fit for me, I love him. And she goes running out of the episode. And, or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> out of the episode? <laughs> out, out of the frame? Out of the movie? Running out of the restaurant and down the street. And I was thinking... That's the same, you know, Fran goes running out of the restaurant and she's running down the street to Baxter. And I was kind of like, that's cool. They kind of mirrored these two movies. But I got the same thing in the beginning of the movie when we first see The Office. Oh, and and it's that mile long looking um, desk rose. Yeah. And I was like, I've seen this in The Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. And I was just like, wow, just seeing, you know, how this movie inspired other films. Oh, this movie is inspired. By your ring. And I know it was also a trick for this movie to show, you know, that many people in one office was just, they kept like, okay, you've got adults that are sitting at their desks. And then further back, they had kids sitting in 
smaller desks. And then behind them, they had like even tinier desks with like little like finger puppet things to look like more people were sitting there. Well, that was a thing that um, uh, Terry Gilliam did in Brazil. Yeah. When to make things because you have to like adjust size for things to make that perspective work. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of that movie, you see that so much because it's almost Kafka-esque where Baxter's this one little peon in this giant machine Mm -hmm. And he's this one little cog that really doesn't matter. He's one of a thousand. Yeah. And it's and it's a thing where, yeah, he's just one guy in this building. And by the end of the movie, you're like, no, no, no. He's C.C. Baxter. He's not Buddy Boy. He's he's C.C. Baxter. He's not Bud. He's C.C. Baxter. And I love the final ending, like, moment that Fran and, and um, Baxter have where he's, where the, she's like, he's like, you... You came back and she's like, yeah, now, now we got to finish our gin rummy game. Well, you, we hear, you know, her running up the stairs and the pop. And again, that's another reference to another movie, The Artist, much later on. Yeah. We have the same kind of, you know, did this really happen or not? And she's just pounding on the door, you know, trying to get him. And you see him with the champagne bottle and he's like, oh, you're here. And, and the first <laughs> thing she asks is, How, how's your knee? Because yeah. that's where you shot yourself and you try to kill yourself that one time. And it's like, oh, that's another callback to a gag from, like, halfway before in the movie that mm-hmm. was for drama. Yeah. And that was even a callback to another gag way before that that was for comedy. Yeah. Great writing. But I, I love that, you know, that he's mid-packing things up because, you know, I quit my job. I'm going to get out of this apartment because it is so tainted. I don't need to be in this life anymore. This, you know... I'm kind of living here, but I'm not because th- that, th- I don't even use my own apartment. Yeah, it, it's basically a, a motel room, and just you know how the neighbor, the, the doctor next door is. You, even with all the women coming and going and all the ruckus that comes out of it, he tells him he's like, you know, I'm really sad to see you leave. He's like, I didn't, you know, help her just because I was a doctor. I helped because I'm your neighbor, and it, you feel like. Don't leave, you know, like, tell them really what you were doing. The but- moment that the doctor calls him a mensch, yeah. that's when, you know, it's like, oh, they finally accepted you at the mm-hmm. last possible moment. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the thing. It's like, oh, when the happily married man finally looks at this guy who's been, who he thought was a philandering whatever, it's like, you know what? You're a decent guy. That's the signal to the audience of being like, yeah, I get, I guess he is kind of a decent guy. And... Finally, the last shot of the movie, the last like interaction, when she's like, we got to finish our Jim Rummy game. And he's like, I love you, Miss Kublik. I absolutely adore you. And that's when you get that Shirley MacLaine smile and she tells, shut up and deal. And end credits. And I, and I love that ending so much because it's Baxter finally admitting and being true to himself. Mm-hmm. He's like, I, I have, he's like, I have my soul back. I have my integrity. Mm-hmm. I have my spine. And he swings his shot. And he's like, I love you. You mm-hmm. are a, a wonderful, amazing woman. I and should have she, told you this a long time ago. And she's over here like, I know, but I'm going to take things slow because she has been so unlucky. Well, she's taking back her own mm-hmm. thing where she's like, yeah, I love you, but I'm not going to jump into this. Like I've done with Shield Drake and all the other people in my life. It's like they both have come to like, you know, catharsis. Yeah. They've come to their, they're, they've finished their arc. And the villain, you know, Shield Drake's, you know, not dead or whatever, but he's divorced. He's alone. He's, alone. he's divorced. His mistress has left him. He's alone on New Year's. He's, you know, and a he's li- sad man now. And he's living at the athletic club. Uh, and I, I love, I love the ending of this movie. Absolutely don't. Me it. too. I, I think it's the perfect way to end this movie. Um, because you could tell they're both content. It's not like before where it's just trying to find any normalcy. You know, who knows? You're you're kind of in the driver's seat now where you could decide how they progress. These two people who have not been in charge of their own lives for so long are now finally in the driver's seat. Yeah. And that's when, you know, the audience is like, all right. The story's over, audience. You can figure it out on your own. Yeah. And, I mean, it makes sense why this movie was nominated for 10 Academy Awards. Won five of them. Uh, It was a big winner. (laughs) Yeah, I was very surprised by, you know, all the awards that it won, it nominated for. 
it was also the last black and white movie to win uh, Best Picture. I I heard about that, yeah, because it was um, because yeah, nineteen sixty, because everything at, yeah, that's when like Technicolor mm-hmm. and, and like actual like color processed film became like just took over completely and became way more dominant after that. Yeah, and and it wouldn't be until twenty eleven when the artist won that another black pi- black and white picture won. You just love that, don't you? Oh, I do. I mean, Schindler's List was before that, but they use a little bit of color in the movie. Oh, you're, you're talking about a complete black and white from top yeah, to bottom. Yeah, the artist is complete black and white. Mm. So it's kind of interesting to see, you know, how this is the last one. And it's not even a thing where you'd think, you know, oh, wow, this is the bl- last black and white picture to ever win the Academy Award. It's just, it just happened. And it's it's also interesting because the movie was actually kind of critically controversial controversial yeah. when it came out because you know the the moral uh the major it, ma- minority majority whatever you want to call it were very like this movie's about adultery infidelity infidelity it's about all these like oh god this this movie cannot see the screens it would cause an uproar because we don't see anything happening in the apartment. Any, nah, nothing more than, like, kissing. We're alluding to what's happening in the apartment, but the Christmas party... Is wild. I mean, people are making out everywhere, and it's just... It was kind of shocking, because... dancing on desks, they're getting hammered. Yeah, because, I mean, you see a movie now, you know, oh, yeah, you're so used to seeing people making out, having sex. You know, that's nothing shocking. But in a movie of this time era, you're like, oh my god, you know, they're like, they're going to town in the middle of the office. Yeah, especially in American movies of this time. Yeah. In, like, Europe, yeah, you, there's a, they're a little bit more racy, but in American studio movies of, of this era, oh god, no, that's, like, way out of the question. And I think that's why a lot of people had this, um, you know, this moral panic over the movie. And also, it probably didn't help that the movie is pseudo-based on uh, real stuff. Yeah. Yeah, because I believe what it was, uh, was that there was like a Hollywood executive that was uh, cheating on his wife with an actress and he mm-hmm. was using his, his you subordinate. You don't say. Yeah, I know, right? And he was using his subordinate's apartment as his love nest until the husband of said actress found out and killed them both in the apartment. And it's like, yeah, yeah that's a pretty like touchy subject and like. But Billy Wilder was like, well, I'm more interested in the guy who owned the apartment. I don't care about the murder thing. How did the guy in the apartment feel? And yeah, it's, and I it's mean, a very interesting um, way this movie kind of exists. It's it, very an interesting place. It's also a different concept, too, you know, because with most love triangles, we're focused on the triangle itself. We're not focused on, you know, the person that kind of knows everything that's going on and doesn't say a word. And it's just like, you know, how did you get sucked into this? And it's so interesting to see how it was just this little thing that snowballed over time and it just took over his life. And it's it's such a smartly written movie that it's so... It it never feels um, hollow when yeah. it's going through. I mean, don't be wrong. Some stuff feels weird, you know, because the movie's really dated. There's parts where you're like, why aren't they just going to a hotel at this yeah, point? Yeah, that, that was a big thing for me. I was like, there were hotels and motels at this time. It's like, go there that but that's why i'm saying this movie is very dated in that sense because at the time in like the 1950s 60s um the new york vice squad would go to hotels Mm -hmm. all the time and be like is anyone in here for an hour or just not staying the night and they would arrest them because they're like well that's prostitution yeah you know that that's what it was in none of you know and that was the thing you couldn't cheat on your wife at a hotel because You'd have to spend the whole night there, and mm-hmm. that's causing a whole other realm of things. Oh, and yeah. a lot of places, they would, um, if you and a woman were checking in, you had to give ID to prove you were married. Yeah. In some, like, hotels. So there's that. that's the thing from a bygone era that this movie never mentions. It just assumes you know it. Th- this is pre-Airbnb. This would be sold with Airbnb. Baxter would make so much money on Airbnb because his apartment looks nice. Yeah, I wasn't too sure what to expect of his apartment. I'm like, okay, single guy, what what are we going to have? And as soon as we walk in, he's got Tiffany lamps. 
Tiffany lamps, tennis racket, uh, spaghetti strainer. This I'm is like, a true bachelor. I'm like, typical guy. You know, <laughs> uh, am I going to have a colander or a strainer? <laughs> so no. sexist. Like, against the male-dominated tennis racket strainer game. Don't act like you wouldn't buy yourself a tennis racket to strain your spaghetti. It seems so efficient. And also, the, the, the pass-off he does, that backhand to get it into, the, that looks so fun. It looks so nice. Also, I was very impressed by those um, Hungry Man meals. The one that he threw into the the oven. It it makes me happy that we had t- uh, TV dinners before microwaves. I mean, I was just like, okay, I'm like, what is he going to get? What is he going to get? It, it's like a, a Christmas present. What is he going to get? And then he opens them like, my God, those are like actual pieces of fried chicken. I'm like, this is not like the... F- frozen meals that we have now where it's just kind of that brownie's a hockey puck that uh um uh burger patty is is barely meat at this point hey you you could talk crap on that but those salisbury steaks and mashed potatoes and macaroni and cheese hit the spot when you're starving and you know what else hit the spots the ending of this episode so boo final thoughts on the apartment. Oh, I give it two thumbs up. Shirley MacLaine's acting is on point just to see the devastation that she goes through in this movie. Uh, such a strong performance. I love Jack Lemon in this movie. I love seeing him go from basically zero to a hundred with this character arc where, you know, he is just spineless and broken and to, no, I, I'm going to be for me. You know, this is my home. Into a mensch. He's a mensch at the end of this movie. He's not a schmuck anymore. But yeah, I give this two strong thumbs up. Um, I too give this movie two big thumbs up. I really, really like this movie. Um, I do think it's a great movie. I really did enjoy it. Um, it's a movie that I think every time I've watched it, I've had, I've always liked it. I've always enjoyed it. I just had different levels of opinions on it. Mm-hmm. And I think now after watching it a couple times, I'm like, yeah, no, this is one of those, like, perfect movies. It's a little dated in some sections, but, like, the themes are so universal, and there's so much fun going on. And Shirley MacLaine, like you said, is giving a masterclass in here. Jack Lemmon is so funny and charming. Fred McMurray is so slimy and mean. Oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, I'm so happy uh, you enjoyed it. Thank you. And it's no wonder that it made Roger Ebert's top films of all time list. But uh, next week... That's another one of your picks. Yes, it is. So and, what are we watching? Well, this, the theme above the theme of this month, you know, we're doing romantic comedies, but we're also looking at how romantic comedies have kind of evolved. The Awful Truth was a very old school screwball studio uh, production code heavy romantic comedy. And the apartment is an evolution on that where it's a lot more of a drama and a comedy. You're doing a lot more with it. And this next movie is a movie that kind of evolves romantic comedies even a little bit more, making them a little bit more neurotic, a little bit more um, jokey, and a little bit more cutaway-y. And it's made by um, maybe not the greatest director, but I hope you'll enjoy the movie. Uh, We're watching Annie Hall next week, directed by Woody Allen. I believe Slime Ball. Stars Woody (laughs) Allen. Slime Ball. And... um, it beat Star Wars for Best Picture. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's what we're going to be watching next week. And um, where can they go to find that? Well, if you want to listen to us on a different platform than you currently are, you can find us on Anchor FM, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And if you want to go to our YouTube channel, you can find it at The Film Vault. And that is The Film Vault on YouTube. We post video versions of this podcast up there. Usually they're slideshows, but we're trying to change that. And we might be presenting new content on there any day now. But if you wanted to follow us on social media, where can they go? You can find us on Instagram at the Film Club Podcast, where we post daily stories, upcoming episodes, trivia, and our random adventures we go on. And with that, we'll see you next week at the Film Club. Have a good week, everybody. See you.